I'm Mark Boris, and this is Straight Talk. What's the MMA deal? Or, <laughs> or are you going to go and learn jiu-jitsu or do something? The network might not allow me to. But you heal pretty quickly, especially <laughs> if you eat the right food. <laughs> Was it bones heal, chicks dig scars? <laughs> Mel Leong, welcome to Straight Talk. You're a little bit random <laughs> in, in terms of things you do, but equally there's a common denominator. And the common denominator is what's someone's story. How can you bring that to life? Yeah. And that's pretty cool. It's not dissimilar to what I've done on MasterChef, which is to be there to create a structure for other people's stories and to celebrate the stories of others. It's for me what I'm realising as I get older and the longer I do this job is it's about the fascination with human stories. That's really what lights my brain up. There are so many different reasons and purposes for why people do what they do. And much like what you do with this podcast. It's That's what I'm trying to find out from you today. Mel Leong, welcome to Straight Talk. Thank you so much for having me. I love your shoes. Oh, thank you. I love your shoes. Thank, well, mine, mine, well, mine are comfortable. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying yours aren't. but No, mine that's, are... that is the common denominator between our shoes is I like things to look nice, but they must be functional and therefore in the case of shoes, comfortable. They look very comfortable. <laughs> they look nice and they also look very comfortable. And uh, Mel, uh, if I just, uh, if you don't mind me asking, you know, just because I always get curious about these things. Um, That's what we Leong, you know, like it sounds like a, a Chinese name. Um, what's your, uh, where were you born and or where were your parents born and what's your actual ethnicity, your background? My parents were born in Singapore. They're ethnically Chinese and I was born in Australia, so I grew up in the Sutherland Shire. Oh, the you're places. a shy girl. I'm a shy girl. Wow. Like, um, well, that, that gives you, <laughs> by the way, that, that gives you a reputation straight up. We'll talk about that a bit later. No, <laughs> okay. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. So you grew, you grew up in the sh- uh, Sutherland area. So uh, mm-hmm. brothers and sisters? You got younger a, brother, five years younger. Yeah, five years five yeah. younger. And why did your parents come to Australia from Singapore? I think the party line has always been to give their – future children greater opportunities and to sort of open up the world a little bit. I think I love Singapore. I love Singaporean culture, but there is, um, it's a very high stress environment. I think everybody would agree with that. And I think they wanted to give their, the idea of future children an opportunity to choose and to maybe have a, a different experience to what they had growing up. It's, it's an interesting place, Singapore. Like, um, I mean, I used to have a business there and uh, well, yeah, I had a business there but we had clients there, customers there, um, nothing to do with my financial service business. Just, it was another business but and I used to go there quite often. And uh, I couldn't believe – I find it a really intense place. Mm. I don't know if you've been there back much but yeah. it's a pretty intense place. You can make a lot of money there um, but unless you've got a lot of money, it's really hard to, hard to enjoy the fruits of Singapore. I agree. I think, I mean, look, money makes everywhere you live in the world easier, obviously. It gives you options. It gives you choices. Um, in a place like Singapore, it um, it's almost like a different world that exists if you have the means. Yeah. Um, if you don't have the means and my, you know, the way my grandparents grew up, um, there's lots of stories of the rise and the fall in, in families, but um, there was a big period of time where my grandparents did not have the means and grew up in HDB flats and and all the rest of it. And um, it's a pretty challenging existence for sure. And that, that probably would have been one of the reasons why your parents came here. They, they wanted to do something better for you. Mm. When they came here, um, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but no, I don't know about the, no, the answer to this, but did they immediately fit into, especially if they were living in the Sutherland Shire, but did they immediately fit into the, you know, the Australian genre, especially around that area? Because that's... You know, the Shire is pretty <laughs> full on, you know. And my brother and sister grew up there, by the way. So mm. I didn't because uh, they're much younger than me, but it's, they grew up there. It's a magical place, the Shire. It's so many It's special, to that's for sure. So many people. What? They didn't immediately settle there. So yeah. I think oh, they, they, right. they immediately settled in um, in the inner city. So the very desirable suburbs um, that they are now were not so desirable. And I think like a lot of migrants, you – gravitate towards people in a similar community or with a similar background to you and that was certainly the case for my folks um, at least in the beginning and then when we moved well when they moved out to the suburbs to live the great Australian dream buy their own slice of paradise or however you'd like to call it um, my mum shares stories about 
how much she prioritised wanting to fit in in the working environment in particular. And where did she work? She wor- She was a uh, registered nurse, so she was an RN at the time and then she sort of moved on to being a nurse unit manager over time and hospital administrator and all the rest of it in the future. But at the time coming in as a young nurse and a new mum and all of those things, she was very particular about she must only speak English at work. She wouldn't bring stinky foods to work. She would only bring sandwiches to work. It was all about um, blending in and being accepted. Yeah, not – not um, it's, it's a tough one. Um, uh, we probably both of you and I, mm. my family, but we born both born here. But when I reflect on it, it's it probably wasn't necessary. But it, nonetheless um, – it's them who made those decisions. And what was your dad doing? Your mum was a an, an registered nurse. What was your mum doing? My hey, dad, sorry. F- my father was a draftsman. So he sort of worked in, in an architectural office and you're like in draftings. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, but you're a writer and a, a foodie. Um, <laughs> how the hell? Like, you're like trying to connect. Yeah, the I'm dots. trying to work I'm it out. Still all, I'm always trying to connect the dots on. Yeah. Well, how'd my you become so much in food? Like, how, how did that work out? That part's easy. If you are Singaporean, an interest in food is – it's innate. So it's co- a cultural thing. They so brought from it's Singapore It's a cultural to here. thing. You, if you are Singaporean, you have any uh, experience living in that environment, you must become obsessed with food. Otherwise really? you don't last. Living long. in Singapore, you mean? Either living in Singapore or being um, from Singapore in, in any capacity. I think it's, it's a deeply cultural thing. And, um, can you explain that to me? Like, I don't, well, obviously I don't understand it, but can you explain it to me? I think part of it is it's such a small place and, um, you know, houses are small, apartments are small, kitchens are small. And so eating out is a huge part of Singaporean culture. So almost every apartment block, every, um, every office building, the bottom of the, the street level um, of, of the building is almost always occupied by food vendors, um, hawker centres. Hawker centre culture is a huge part of um, the egalitarian part of Singapore. You know, it's accessible to everybody and everybody loves it. You know, it doesn't matter if you are pulling up in a Lamborghini or um, you happen to roll on down from the HDB down the road. If it's good food, you agree on it. And I think that's um, that's a wonderful thing about f- good food. Yeah, it, it definitely when it comes to good food. So does that mean though then growing up, um, whether you grew up in the city, in a city, or whether you grew up in Sutherland, mm. it doesn't really matter. Does is mum and dad sort of mum's work on probably shift work too? We're giving a bit of registered nurse definitely in the night early shift. days. Yeah. They, we had very little family here, so my mother worked night shifts. My father worked an office office hours, and that way someone could take care of me. And then when my brother came along, him as well. So so how, how does the food thing figure? Because, you know, we are not like that here in Australia, um, Australians anyway. We, you know, we don't have restaurant at the bottom of our building. Um, the, in those days, well, uh, my brother and sister, as I said, grew up in the southern Shire. My parents moved there when I was – when I left home sort of thing. But I remember there was – we they had a house in Sylvania and there was a – one Chinese restaurant called Len Hong's, just at the bridge <laughs> at Sylvania. Isn't it funny how it just sticks in the Tom mind? Hi- Tom Hagley's Bridge, you just want- there. Yeah. Oh, I, I remember, yeah. I remember just that. across the road was the uh, Greek hamburger person, the Z- Zara Fosses. And uh, then, and then uh, the seafood restaurant down the road. That's right. And, there yeah. was, and, there was, and then there's Len Hong's uh, Chinese restaurant. But there wasn't much in terms of uh, Asian food in, in that area when I was going back to visit my parents um, mm. that I recall. Um, so where was the food culture sort of germinated from? I know that the culture's there, I get it, but how did yeah. it get expressed? We still ate out. Like my parents sacrificed a lot. They worked very hard. We didn't go out a lot. It wasn't We didn't do annual holidays or anything like that going up until a little bit later. But we would inevitably gravitate towards communities where we knew that that Good food was available. So for us, it was Bankstown, it was Cabramatta. Are oh, you going to the the area? Yeah. So we would go on little weekend trips and and buy things. And the the weekly tradition for for me was I grew up swimming. Um, I had very bad asthma as a baby, and so um, swimming was just part of that um, that recovery process and making sure I was robust enough to survive. You know um, the life, um, so my dad would drop me off at uh, Bankstown swimming pool. Oh, that's where I first learned to swim. No way. Seriously, yeah, yeah, I, a different coach, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but 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 uh, no, at Bankstown, hundred percent. Yeah, that's the very first place I learned to swim. 
Well, there you go. We have that in common now. But, but banks, and then he would have go off to so one he'd of the. So he go off and do some of the the Asian grocery shopping for the week because there are so many Asian grocers, a huge Vietnamese community. Totally there. big. There's a street of Vietnamese restaurants at the so, back of Bankstown. So um, good sports club. for um, still to this day, you know, epic. Um, but also, I was having a conversation with someone earlier about it. Um, enmeshed within that was still. Um, the Greek and Italian populations, Lebanese community as well. And so you would have such an eclectic group of shops where you'd have an amazing continental deli next to a fantastic Asian grocer and the mix of the smells and the sights and the sounds. It was just a very... Saturday was just this happy market day where families were running around and kids were everywhere. And so my dad would go and do some of the groceries, pick me up, and then the reward was um, was always a, a curry puff and a, and a coconut drink. And um, and then we'd do the rest of the groceries and, and head on home. And that would fuel us for the week in terms of um, ingredients that we couldn't get at the local shops. So where did your uh, that's your exposure, but where did you first become interested in food? I mean, a, as a, as a, not as a profession, I guess is. Um, but I'll tell you where. I'll tell you. It was Yum Cha. Yum Cha. Where? It was where? Yum Cha. Uh, just not far from where you're talking about. There was a, a really eventually. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, but a huge Chinese restaurant on the corner there. And almost every Sunday we would go to Yum Cha. And when I was old enough to invite friends from school, I would always be allowed to invite like one friend from school to come with me. And I realised pretty quickly how much delight I took in introducing friends who were not ethnically Chinese to the delights of dim sum. Um, And, And probably chicken's feet. Oh, it's yeah, so, yeah. it's, I mean, the discomfort on someone's yeah, yeah. face, you know, watching, the, oh, that's steam about, oh, that's for us. Oh, that's going to be in front of me on the table. What do I, what do I do? Oh, I can't, I can't do that. And just watching them consolidate that sensory experience of the sights, the sounds, the smells of this sort of reasonably unfamiliar place. And, and yum cha restaurants are, it's a calamity. There's so it's much. It's for me. There's so much going on there. Are waiters tossing plates all over the place. They're towering, like uh, you know, t- there are towers of bamboo baskets just sort of balancing precariously. There's tea spilled on the table. There are sauce everywhere. It's it's just such a, a happy mess and such a brilliant time. It's I like to call it signs of a good time. You know, it's it's you can see the evidence. It's it's there on the white tablecloth in front of you or. Maybe salmon coloured tablecloth. It's always salmon. Um, but I, I loved encouraging people to eat things that they were unfamiliar with. And sometimes it was a success, but always if they accepted the invitation to try something new, there was this sense of accomplishment that they would have. And I, in turn, would just feel so happy and satisfied that I had encouraged them to see food a little bit differently and that happened from you know being a kid like being 12 so um, uh, <laughs> did you delight in their um reactions i mean uh, uh, like i can imagine because i've done this i did this sort of similar thing with kids of greek food but like they never taste an olive for example they're like what the hell <laughs> because it's pretty salty and uh, they, they just and uh, some of the meals that we used to have but and my i sort of Similar sort of experience. We didn't go to restaurants. We mostly did it at family places. But yeah. um, I used to delight oh, in the their re- reactions. the restaurants I'm talking about are like humble, humble places. Yeah. We grew up, we never, never, f- fancy food, fine diners. That was a part of my later life. That was definitely part of my adult life. My parents are still um, wary of fine diners i think but anyway sorry i'm similar i'm already <laughs> i'm still the same but i mean but, but but i used to delight in their response like you know oh my god like uh, did you delight in the response of um when, well, i just keep thinking of chicken feet when i think of uh, <laughs> yum cha but did you delight in the response when they went what the hell what the hell is that like uh it, it, was that fun shock value is always a little bit entertaining and when i I've, i i don't think i've done anything in my life deliberately to shock but i i think there's just something funny and light about humanity where we enjoy the juxtaposition we enjoy that um that the crossroads where there's a bit of discomfort going on but because there's also an opportunity to expand your perspective and I was 
good or bad, the reaction good or bad, um, I always, I was just fascinated in watching that process, like reading someone's face and just sort of seeing how they're taking on this new information and whether or not they're going to accept it or not. Um, it's, I, I don't know, I think it's just that fascination with people. Yeah, and so because that brings me to the question of the, uh, about curiosity. Do you, I mean, do you think, uh, given that you're a writer, you have to be curious, but um, do you have a, a curiosity as to the, uh, forget about the, for the moment, about the taste and um, the colour and the... How can you the, forget about that, Mark? No, just, if you just, <laughs> if you just for a moment, just okay. park it for a second. But were you always curious about the theatre of people trying different types of foods? And Because you did talk about the theatre of Yamcha. There is a lot of theatre associated with it. Yeah. And it's not really put on. It's actual – that's just how it all rolls out. Oh, yeah. Um, but at the same time, it wouldn't be the same if it wasn't there. So it's nearly like a precondition to having Yamcha. You've yeah. got to have theatre. So if I'm running a Yamcha joint, I've got to, I'm actually going to make sure there's theatre <laughs> because uh, I want to make sure that everybody gets the full experience. So, But have you always been curious about the theatre of eating, the, th- the theatre that food provides – Yes, I think so. And that has only grown the more I've incorporated food into my working life and my career and, you know, the inevitable existentialism of, of what I do. Um, the, the dance of food etiquette, um, the way people carry themselves in different environments, um, when you feel like a fish out of water in different in, in, in different dining environments when you don't know what to do with all this cutlery in front of you. Um, there's there's an interesting discovery process involved in watching people undergo that experience or experiencing that for myself. Yeah, for because sure. ultimately you were in the ultimate um, theatre, that's um, Master Chef, which we'll talk about in a second, but that, that's the ultimate theatre. But, theater, but you did experience a the theatre when you were a kid um, mm. and – and also, uh, I guess, not just yourself, but watching your friends' experience. And you tend to – did you did you find that you sort of – if you look back on it, it's sort of like you doing an assessment of audiences, um, you know, because <laughs> you know, they are your audience. I mean, your friend who you invite along and then other people who are sitting in that room, in the Yum Cha room, which is not just – Chinese people or Asian people, it's a, it's a full suite of different everyone. people, yeah. And you're looking at you, you know, you're sitting there observing all this stuff. And it's, it's a massive theatre. Mm. Um, do you reckon you ever took? Do, do you think subliminally you have taken something out of those experiences into into the show? I I don't know about that. I think more simplistically, it was more the essence of or the notion of hospitality. But and what is hospitality to you? But it's a it's about generosity. It's about making people feel comfortable to a to a degree, but also to maybe open up their world. So I, I can see where you're going with that, which is there is this, um, you know, this tipping point where it is both those things. Um, but I am inherently a feeder, so I think what I'm what I was probably motivated by earlier on is wanting to give people things, wanting to give people experiences um, and then delighting as a side effect in witnessing that. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. So when you say you're a feeder, I think what you mean by that is you wanted to display generosity. Um, can I ask you about that? Because that's a very interesting, you know, what would be – people don't refer to the that word – these days as a virtue, but it is a well-known virtue going right back to Arist- Aristotelian times back in, you know, 500 BC, 600 BC. Um, I love how anyone with Greek culture is always of course, able it, to bring it back down. Everything, to everything's it. got something to do with Greece. It originated in ancient Greece. Well, that's, that's I, I tell you why, because we're, that we're limited to that knowledge. <laughs> that's, that's why we do it, because that's our only reference point. But, um, if you, but if you go back, I mean, like generosity is no, a well-known virtue. But I often wonder about, you know, it's like forgiveness, but I often look at things like generosity and sometimes I look at generosity as not really someone being generous t- towards the other person, but they offer generosity because it rewards them themselves. Oh, absolutely. It's, a, it's nearly a selfish thing. I, I don't a, mean a bad way. No, I, I yeah. agree with you. That is completely correct. I think it's a two-way thing. You There is a payoff for the person correct. giving. Absolutely. It's if, if that's your love language is to give, you derive enjoyment and satisfaction from 
observing the response to your actions. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, that part is I absolutely accept. So I don't, and don't where does that come from in you then? So, like, I, I'm trying to work <laughs> out, like, uh, <laughs> What, what, I mean, you generous when you were young. Um, you were still generous. You still play that. Because being a writer, you've got to be generous too. There, there's a lot of generosity being a writer. You've got to share so much stuff and you've got to put effort into it as well. And you have to well. be real about it as well because yeah. people know. If you're bullshitting. Absolutely. So where does that come from in you? Have you ever thought that through about yourself? Where, why am I like that? I think I've learned by example. I think my my mum in particular is an incredibly generous person. That's one of her love languages. Is well, she's a nurse. Give. She's a nurse. Acts of Straight service up. are part of who she is in a vocational sense, in a parental sense, and I've been the, the grateful recipient of that and I think you learn by doing. Yeah, um, well, what you see. You, what you see you do. If you can see it, you can be it, all mm. of those things. Yep. And then later on you can choose if that suits you or it doesn't suit you. But I think I inherited that from from her and I, I, I come from a big family of um, particularly women who feel the same way about generosity. It's it's part of who they are. It's They do it because they enjoy it and um, I'm just following that, well, following that, <laughs> well, Mel, I mean, that I, bloodline. Because I often think about why do I do not this show so much but the, the mentor show but it's because – you know, I, I will say, you know, I like to help people, but really I, it's, it's reward-based for me. Um, it's They get a reward. They, they get something out of listening to me, I hope, but uh, I, it's a reward in it for me. And what I know about myself is that I, I'm continually feeding my reward centre of my brain and, uh, you know, I'm obviously a lot of chemicals are being released that make me feel good. So it's a, it's a feel-good it's a feel feel good effort from my point of view, and therefore I get very curious about people like yourself, who you call yourself a feeder, and your mother's a nurse, so she's therefore a giver, um, and uh, the and it's a good reward. It's not like taking drugs where you get a reward as well, because that that fucks you up. But mm. these things are high quality reward center based actions, sustainable. Yeah, and sustainable mm. through life, through your whole life, you can do this forever, and it can and because when we're I mean, we look at why we're living on this planet. What, what the fuck are we doing here? Like, what is this? <laughs> well, it is basically about that. Finding things that work well societally um, that give us a reward and mm. give, someone else, uh, give someone else an outcome, a good outcome. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Whether it's you know, having kids, um, which rewards everybody around us, or whether it's uh, you know, doing what I do or lending money to somebody or um, guiding someone or helping them out. Um, in whatever, that's really at, at its most fundamental level. And food, of course, is one of the most fundamental ways of displaying that. Yes. And so you've ad, you've ad, you've adopted food, yeah, as your reward center. Absolutely. It's not just because food is <laughs> colorful. Because f- f- food's a great instrument because it's colorful, it smells, it tastes, it's tactile. Yeah, it's, it's, it's everything. A, it's a multi-dimensional sensorial experience. There is alchemy involved in the. Oh, I love that word alchemy. I love that word alchemy. <laughs> Can we just explore, explore that word Let's for a second, please, it. Mel? Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, I mean, of course, uh, uh, one of my favourite books is The Alchemist. Uh, not because it's a bit of a, a kid's book, but when I say kids, like a younger person's book, but what it's, it's sort of – It's a rite of passage The book. philosophy of it is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and and obviously the you know, the moral of the story is pretty important too. But, um, but alchemy with food – I mean, Heston Blumenthal's is probably the ultimate at that, you know, For using Anadria, food and turning you know, something into something so weird. So many, yeah. But just just a, a normal fun meal I think has alchemy in it. Like, and I'll tell you I why. Agree if I, if, and I would like to hear what you say. I can be feeling like shit and uh, I can go to my sister's place as a great cook and she will present to me, a meal that's well cooked, well like well made, good ingredients, nothing fancy, mm. made with lots of love. Um, but also she plays around with it the way it looks, and uh, and my community does this. Greek community does this all the time, um, and I, I immediately my mood changes. Immediately, and I might go back to the mood after when I'm driving it's home. It's magic, but it's it is magical, mm. and alchemy is about magic. I actually think as much as I respect, deeply respect operators within the industry that have pushed food to 
you know, beyond the bounds of what we could conceive as being food. It's where art meets science meets existentialism and, and all of the rest of it. I, the, the more time I spend in food, the more I believe that the simplest food, soul food, if you like, contains the most alchemy, contains the most magic because its ability to, tra- to transform um, your mood, to comfort you, to soothe you when you are, when you are hurting or you're sad, all of those things, to, to, um, to go to when you're happy and to celebrate. That's, that's, there's, there's so much beauty in that and I think that that intangible feeling that you get from, you know, a bowl of chicken soup, you know, a bowl of congee, whatever it happens to be, some noodles, in any culture, in any language, you don't need to understand the existentialism of it, you just need to feel it and that's if nothing more, the most human thing that you can do and be in that moment. I, I, can I just sort of lean into a few of those words you, you use then? Um, um, comfort is, is a really good one um, for me. Comfort food. Um, but probably you have a greater understanding of the emotions associated with food generally. Um, but if we just lean into the word comfort, um, Asian people that I know, and also Greek people I know, but to a lesser extent because what's Asian people have been here a lot shorter time than, say, the Greek people here um, in terms of bigger communities I'm talking about. And I think it's sort of been bred out of the Greek community, getting bred out of the Greek community a little bit, but still quite fresh and new with the Asian community. They are much more attuned to, um, you know, I don't know, you mentioned the, the Vietnamese meals like uh, pho, pho, however they pronounce it, um, <laughs> or, ch- or chicken soup. You know, like uh, especially if you're not feeling well, you know, like uh, chicken noodle with noodles or, uh, you know, all those types of meals. This need, um, this sort of really important thing in my life, if I'm an Asian person, to try these foods and I'll drive to Bankston or Cabramatta or I'll drive <laughs> to Fairfield or wherever it is to, to experience it. Mm. It's so important to – I don't think it's cultural. I think it's individual – Individuals feel like they just need this. Where the hell? Uh, how? Why is it so powerful? Uh, the need to go to the ends of the earth to to try it out, pursue a particular meal, even if it's fourteen bucks, it doesn't really matter. I mean, the cheaper the better, really. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, that's part part of the game. It that, costs that's, nothing. That's, that's the great thing about you know um, hawker food. Like if you go to a hawker market. Um, the best chicken and rice, like Hainanese chicken and rice, might cost you five bucks. And everybody from billionaires to old grandmothers who have to, you know, count their pennies will go there for that. What, what is that? Thing. That's in Singapore, I know, because there is a place called, I think there is a place called Hawker's Market or something like that. Well, it's just a Hawker Centre is a place that you have lots of different outlets. It's like they're little indoor, kiosks. like an indoor-outdoor food court. Yeah, the like. one I went to was outdoor. Yeah. And if it rained, yeah. you're, you're stuffed. Like uh, Max, Maxwell is a, one of the most famous what's ones. What's it called? It's Maxwell, Maxwell Hawker Market. And right. it's, it's a covered... Um, you know, covered sort of uh, food court, but it's you know, um, so it's a open air food court. Well, if we bring bring it back to yeah. Australia, so, <laughs> but no, but if, if if we do, where is your equivalent to you? Where where today do does Mel want to go to f- to Ooh. find that, and why? why? It's, it's for me, food is deeply rooted in context. So it, it's about how you're feeling, it's about who you're with, and what dish occurs to you that you need at that moment like what's the perfect thing that's going to complete the picture are you thinking about that before you go there you, on the way there are you thinking it's just a, it's just a feeling so if i um it might just be as simple as what what i cook so if i'm feeling a bit under the weather and um you know i, I feel like i need something warm and brothy and soothing it might not necessarily be you know chinese food like i've um, I love cooking, um, you know, from all sorts of different um, cuisines across the world. But uh, Italian is a, a really classic one. I might want a bowl of, you know, pastina and just make – it's the simplest broth in the world to make. It doesn't take very long. It's imbued with soul and you don't have to speak the language to understand how why that is. You know, chicken broth – there's just something about it. It's universal. We it comforts us. It's physically nourishing. We know that to be true. Um, I'll I'll make I'll make that. It seems like every and community has that. By the way, the Jewish people have it. Italians have it. The Greeks there have are it. These universal meat on Chinese sticks. have it. Meat on sticks. Yep. 
um, fried chicken, um, some kind of chicken soup, some kind of dumpling. Like there are these universal foods that almost every culture in the world will have uh, meatballs, uh, a version of it, and it means a great deal to them because it's it's what carries their particular preference for flavour profile and texture and all of those things. So it's universal but it's also extremely nuanced to um, to the consumer or to the originator. Yeah, it, it, do you think that we um, sort of build some sort of um, neurological um, response to how food becomes comfort food to us? Like I know that um, there are some – and I, I probably for a period of my life, I sort of disca- disreg- I, I discarded these things. I stopped thinking about it. But then as I've got older, I'm I starting to turn back to them. Mm. And there are certain types of biscuits, for example, and the, the Greek biscuits called kuluri, um, which I, I, I di- I'm desperate to have with it when I have a coffee. Mm. Um, but I probably haven't really thought about it for 40 years. But I think of my grandmother. They're sort of a dry biscuit and it's got a, got a, a, a braiding a, pattern thing on it. Yeah. It's a dipper. It's yeah, and you put a little bit in there. It's company. got a bit of an orange taste. It's got not much, not very sweet, it's got, but it's got orange rind in it usually and a little yeah. bit of sugar and not much. It's not very sweet. It's more dry. But um, And then so, there are various meals that I'm starting to, as I get older, I'm starting to revert to and I'm thinking, what, why am I thinking this? Why, why am I feeling um, unhappy with my life or is it um, <laughs> or is it just an age thing? What What's the deal? I mean, do you... Do you have any views on that? Like, I mean, oh, I'm, 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 see, I feel like I'm in a therapy session with you, but oh my goodness, I'm I'm honoured that you feel that. Yeah, way. because I mean, you study these things. I mean, you know these things. I think the one word that comes to mind when you describe what you're describing is nostalgia. Yeah, you know, and as we age, we become um, fond of reflection. You know, self reflection is part of. Um, part of our journey, isn't it? You know, you get to a point where you think about what you've learned, you think about how your life compares to, you know, when you meet someone younger and what their current experience is and you're like, oh, that that doesn't match up with my my perspective because I'm at a different point in my life. And I think the older we get, the more nostalgia means something to us because we have had the time to accrue those memories, to layer them upon each other. And I think the things that stick out to us they're the most powerful memories. They're the ones worth holding on to. So, you know, the, the biscuits that your yaya would have served you with tea when you were growing up, like the smell of the orange rind, the texture of that dry biscuit, the way it would transform as you dip it into the cup of tea, all of those sensory things come back to you. And again, they're the simplest memories, but they are the most powerful. They're the ones that we're going to remember, you know, at, in, in, our, in our last days you know, on this earth and these bodies. And, yeah, I think for me nostalgia is such a powerful tool in cooking. It's what the best chefs in the world of every level and calibre are able to wield in their kit of, of skills is how do you knit nostalgia into food? Like you go to a, a three-hat fine dining, you know, three Michelin star place and things since sometimes food doesn't really look like food. Yeah. But if somehow you're able to infuse um, a scent, a texture, a flavour, um, a shape into the food, suddenly it goes from being that's a very overworked fancy plate of food to I can taste my grandmother's brodo in this and that's – that's what gets people. That's what gets me as a writer um, and, and, a, and a person who works in food that does communicate those feelings um, is, is that. It's, it's the magic. Nostalgia is one of the most powerful ingredients you can cook with. So is that where alchemy comes in then, if I could go back to that? that so it's about weaving nostalgia into the thing you present. I think so. And that's the alchemy. Mm. Like how do I get a carrot that, you know, there's an orange thing that's, you know, the shape of a carrot and it's like just come out of the ground, whatever it is. <laughs> it's sort of sitting there. I bought it at the market for a buck. Um, and uh, and then how do I – it's funny. I had a, co- a conversation with Colin Fasnage one, one time about this exact oh, point. Um, he was telling me about – he was showing me how to cut up a, a carrot and he's saying, do you know that most people waste most of the carrot? And uh, and I and I, and I, I couldn't believe the amount of um, uh, detail 
that he knew about carrots and uh, and how to get the most out of it. Yeah. Um, you know, like and, and don't waste anything because one of the things I love about chefs, a good chef, is that they don't waste shit. No. Everything gets used. And it makes sense to me now. I never used to think about it, but it's, don't be wasteful when it comes to food or, ingredient, or can, ingredients. Not when you can sell it, not when you can value add. You look at the, the margins on restaurants, they're so fine. Why would you throw out something that can add an extra dimension of flavour to something? Um, you know, peels and tops of carrots, for example, can be so many things, but the simplest thing you could do is collect them and turn them into a stock. Yeah. You know, it's it's a very, very easy thing. The, the you know, if you're going to throw them away, compost them for God's sake because those nutrients can at least go back into some soil in your backyard, whatever it happens to be. But the alchemy thing I think is twofold. Yes, it's nostalgia. That is, that's a, you know, a, a more lofty way of, of thinking about one of the many skills that chefs can have at their disposal but also it's the transformation of ingredients, so raw ingredients into um, amazing textures, amazing cohesion on the plate, um, all of the contrasting elements that bring together something that is deep and complex and bright and makes you feel something is making you feel something as the nostalgia ingredient that is, um, you know, is blended in there. But you also need to have all of these other skills in transforming, you know, a root vegetable into maybe something that's invisible on the plate but gives great depth of flavour or sweetness or whatever it happens to be. You now sort of made me think about the MasterChef series, which you've, <laughs> which you've just you, – you've only announced you're not going to do any no, more MasterChef. Segue. Yes, very segue. Um, but <laughs> when you're on that show, that show is – well, you tell me. Um, is that show about what you just said? Mm. That is about no waste, alchemy, uh, weaving nostalgia – or is it, which sort of makes me think more about fundamental food, really basic food, mm -hmm. or is it more about theatre and presentation and emotions? I think it's a mixed bag of all of those things. I think for me the realisation that I have come to have reflecting on my time at MasterChef has been stories. We communicate our stories through food. If you are a cook, if cooking is part of the way you communicate to people, then you convey stories through that. So this is my my grandmother's recipe. This is um, a recipe that is highly prized and deeply rooted in the culture that I'm from. Um, this is what my mother would cook for me when, um, you know, in her last days. And this is something I wanted to share with you. So there are, I think there are so many nuanced layers to what MasterChef is but the one that I love is, is is storytelling and it's being part of the structure that allows people to feel comfortable enough to go there to be vulnerable and to show who the they contestants are, are the contestants yep. to show who they are through what they cook and yes the mechanism of a giant clock and you know and fireballs in the ad break and all of those things it's fun it's a format that is easily digestible it's easy to understand and it's light and we need lightness in life there are so many heavy horrific things going on in the world um, but we mustn't discount entertainment it's the thing that gives us respite it's a thing that allows us to pause and take a breath and um, and just not think about things too much sometimes and so I love the show because yes it has that lightness but it still has depth to it it still has a sense of purpose to it and when you speak to contestants that have gone through the show you know a number of which I I still keep in contact with the the party line about this show potentially transforming your life and allowing you um, passage into a an industry that you've only dreamt of. That much is true. There is a tangible part of that. It can happen. Doesn't it's not guaranteed, but it can happen. So there is that shining, um, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. That that is a potential outcome for a contestant that applies to go on the show as well. So what's the role? What do you see as your role oh, as a judge? Mm -hmm. My role as a judge is a little bit of a few things. One of them is as a mentor. 
I think you so need guidance to to guide. You know, there are there are fundamental parts of cooking that you need to guide people through. Like, it's taken years, but I can smell within a degree if something's about to burn, and I know it. We all like if you're trained to smell it, you can't unsmell it, mm. and you will go over to someone and say that is seconds away from burning. I'd keep an eye on that because they are. We are ask, asking them to focus on all the other spinning plates that they have going on as well. And so it's about sort of giving them that that technical advice. It's also for me, um, I don't know that I walked into the role expecting it, but to be of an emotional support to people and to encourage them to feel like it was a safe space to be who they are um, in their shining moments but also in their vulnerability and their their failures because as we all know and the older that we get the failure is so important mm. if you don't fail if you don't embrace failure and the lessons and the gifts that it gives you you are ignoring the most powerful things that life can teach you so you know yeah, there's, there's that there's that part of it so to to create an environment in which people feel safe to fail is a privilege and I, I get to do that on Dessert Masters still, even though it's a professional context. So the contestants are professional pastry chefs. We're still human though. So to continue to be associated with um, offering safe harbour is a privilege of who I have become in that space. And was that in any stage confronting to you? Totally. Um, yeah, in the beginning. <laughs> totally. Because yeah. um, you probably didn't know what your real deal was when you did your rock up. Yeah, I'm going to be a judge. Yeah, I can judge the food. I turned up thinking, look, I, I can do. I know food. I can stand there in a pretty dress. I can deliver lines. I can tell you what I think about your food. I, I can do all the technical parts of the job for sure. It's fine. I can smile um, sometimes, <laughs> but I think in the doing, I was humbled. Because the most powerful parts of what have resonated with people is in finding the power in human connection. Even when you're judging someone, you're still connecting with someone, you still need to know something of them in order to understand what they've produced and how they've produced it. So, so you, you, you give the, basically you're giving them a, a place to, to reach out to you. So, you know, because yeah. you've got to get to know the people. I mean, and they're, they're putting themselves on show. Yeah, they sign, they sign up for it, um, absolutely. And yes, connection is the goal. It's also impossible to connect on an extremely deep level with every single contestant yeah, because right. you have up to 24 every single year coming through and I can only imagine what it must be like for the former judges to have gone through 11 years of that. That's, that's so many people. And, of course, you're not going to have that moment with everybody as much as you might want to. Statistically, it's just not possible. But when you do have that moment, that's really special and that's what makes the job worth doing. Can I sort of throw something out that's completely different all that now? I mean, I want to talk about your writing after this, but today there's a, a lot of discussion about health, health span, lifespan, eating healthily. Yeah. Um, and you know, they talk a lot about, for example, less Less meat, more uh, or less protein more from veg, meat. Less meat. Yeah, protein. we lost more fiber. You know, yep. gut biome feed your gut biome and all that sort of stuff. You know, and have you know a soluble fiber as opposed to insoluble fiber. There's a lot of technical scientific stuff, and there's a big movement around this stuff today. Yeah. Um, do we need to reconcile that with what you ordinarily would get presented with um, in terms of let's call it tasty food or presentable food or theatrical food is a how do we reconcile those two things i think we need both you know it's it's like art and science yeah it's um it's it's one is art action one is science you're right correct and but we need both to be human you, know, you can't take the art out of the world otherwise what would be the point of living but you can't live if you're not nourishing yourself so you've got completely. to inject the science into the are we talk, so but are you talking about br blending them though? so i think that both are important you know i celebrate indulgent rich beautiful things on television and that's you know that's to be commended you know it's very difficult to create food like that to generate bags of flavor as, as Andy Allen would say uh, is hard and you should acknowledge 
that someone is capable of doing that. But I don't go home and eat that way all of the time. Right. And I think that, you know, people, you know, see what people, you know, look up about me occasionally. And um, to think that I also eat like that at home or that I, I go out to eat every single night of the week at, you know, fancy restaurants and things like that. Yes, there are times of, of my job where that is required, but you need to nourish yourself properly. You know, the fundamentals of being human is to keep the body alive and to keep the body alive for a long time, hopefully, there are certain things you need to do. And that is, as you mentioned, all of, all of the things, pay attention to your gut microbiome, your fibre intake, you know, how you consume protein, what forms of protein you consume, um, macros, all of that, they're, they're really important. So but we're also moving down the track now. You know, red meat's no good. They, they, uh, environmentally, you know, we, we've got those movements. Um, so it seems to me that the food industry or the restaurant industry, or, or, I don't know, the, let's call it the food preparation industry, is sort of has a f- sort of has a few headwinds potentially up against it. Um, um, and, and I don't say it's a bad thing or, or a good thing. It's just an observation of mine. It's a, it's a complex web because you need to think about this from the soil up. Yeah. And any farmer is going to tell you that. You don't have food if you don't have farmers. You don't have farms and food if you don't have healthy soil. This goes all the way down to the earth. And it's good to – yes, of course, we know that, say, um, excessive red meat consumption is um, not brilliant for our bodies. It's also not super sustainable. But if you take away beef farming or you cut, you know, cattle farming in half, let's look at the human ramifications of that multi-generational family. They've been, they've been cattle farming for eight generations on this land. You're just telling them to cut their business in half. Where's the sustainability in that? Where's the human consideration for um, who they are and what they do next? What happens to the economy? You can't make, as you know better than I do, knee-jerk reactions economically and expect there to not be far-reaching um, ramifications of that. So we know that there are changes that need to be made um, for our diets, for the environment, the sustainability of our world but it's a it's a complex moving living thing you know it's very dynamic it's an incremental move towards something better rather than a knee jerk reaction where we just cut and run so does mel yong in her writings um does in your in your comms work you know as a writer do you feel in any way an obligation to build that reconciliation um, and reconciliation is a word we, we use in lots oh. of <laughs> contexts in Australia, but do you, it's a and around the world, word, isn't it? yeah, but these things need to be, will need to be reconciled um, because like, I, cause I tell you why I, I, you know, I listen to a lot of stuff about living longer and all that sort of stuff for the obvious reasons because I'm getting fucking old, you know. Um, but, <laughs> Same, mate. But, 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 but like, and then and then I go out and I want to take my dad out for his 89th birthday so I take him to somewhere he would not ordinarily go mm. and then, of course, all my sons want to come along and, uh, you know, and then that's a, like a, a six-person event um, and so I take him somewhere fancy and I might go to, you know, Dad Likes Rockpool. The only time he ever goes rock pool if I take him, um, but he likes rock pool. <laughs> Someone else is picking up yeah, the correct. check. Yeah, correct. And it's not cheap, there. but uh, and uh, <laughs> unfortunately none of us drink. But so like we we but we eat and we enjoy the meal. And but you know what happens to me? I walk out mm. and I think fuck, I didn't have any vegetables. Um, and I actually get a guilt trip from the other shit that I'm watching or reading about ah. lifespan, health span. So no, but it, it's not it, not to you, but to, it, not a guilt trip. But I go, oh shit, like. I've sort of interrupted my really good program um, and I just think that I'd like to bring the two worlds together and yeah. I wonder whether people like you could start these things, like reconciliation and how do you but this live is your thing, life? Is it, it, it's not about eating perfect meals. Like as anyone in, you know, nutrition or, you know, the, the fitness space will tell you that one guilt meal, one cheat meal is not going to ruin your diet. It's about the cumulative total of what you do in a week, a month, a year. Um, And as long as you're trending towards eating more of the things you know you should eat and, you know, scratching that itch. Because if I'm the kind of person, if I cannot get the thought of a slice of pizza out of my head, 
nothing I cook or eat that's not a pizza is going to be good enough. So if you can't get it out of your head, stick it in your mouth. So, well, pretty much, <laughs> you know, go and get that, go and get the best possible slice of pizza. Like enjoy it, sit down, don't be on your phone. Um, do, go, go and eat with someone that you, um, that you love spending time with. Enjoy that moment, savour it for what it is. You don't need to eat the whole pizza. Have I would. Whatever. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's really good, then you should um, because waste is also bad. But um, enjoy the moment and then go back to making sure that you eat your vegetables and all of the rest of it. I think what eating a really beautiful meal, like going to Rockpool with your family and not having enough vegetables or having the rich sauces or whatever it happens to be, I mean, God bless Bert Blanc. I mean, come on. Rich, creamy sauces are... Well, I love their chips. Worth living... Chip, oh I mean, God. and look. their macaroni thing, whatever it was called. I mean, I, I, I mean, hot, I, hot oil and potatoes oh and God. salt. Never met one. Yeah, never yeah, met a combo. Yeah, I didn't fat like and that. Salt and uh, oh. whatever it is. I mean, <laughs> but, because, but do you think that Mel that in, at some point, given these movements, yeah. that there will be restaurateurs who will um, exercise their alchemy and create these super healthy foods, but they're also Fucking tasty, like like it's it's you know. It's I mean, po- like Look, there are there are chefs that specialize in that. Are they that, okay? That cook beautiful food that's really rich with nutrients, and that's all being considered. And those those restaurants exist. They're not accessible for everybody, but no. they do exist. I think it's far more plausible and approachable for most people to, you know, you're wasting that expensive meal if you come away going, "Gosh, should have." No, I only thought about it the next day. Vegetable. But I, but I enjoy thought, the fuck. moment, I think, and then and then, you know, eat your chia pudding, whatever it is that you it's want to do. Well, yeah, I, I don't, yeah. I, I'm not that sort of um, fussy about it, but it's more a, a thought process, mm. you know, because I, I, I'm thinking, and, and to some extent, I, I guess I'm being, I'm getting a bit brainwashed because there is a movement, and uh, it, that it's a bit like, as you said. Older people tend to get nostalgic. Um, older people also tend to think about how the fuck do I'm going to live longer? Um, because yeah. you know the years are flashing by, and um, and especially if you can afford it, hmm. um, which I'm in the fortunate position to be. And so you you tend to, but I sort of brainwash myself about this stuff, and um, because I believe in it, I actually do believe in it, you know, because I believe you are what you eat, yeah. and uh, and the more healthy you are, the more healthy you, the more healthy you eat, the more healthy you will be. I think. And I often and I often it's, bemoan. It's, it's counterbalancing that with joy. I think yeah, because that's, that's, that's what I wanna, that's what I want to talk about. So the, how the, do we bring the happiness and uh, like because we're going back to virtues. Yeah. You know, joy, gratitude, generosity. Are you saying then perhaps we, the people that, like if I use me as one example, Mark, you need to learn or rem- or remember. The importance of being generous to yourself, mm. the importance of um, having gratitude for the opportunity to eat tasty food on this occasion, um, the importance of understanding how to enjoy yourself with everybody else who's around you as opposed to thinking about is this really the right thing I should be eating. Mm. Are you saying that we are perhaps someone like me and maybe there's a new cohort of people studying to develop like this who are forgetting the reason why we eat together? I think we can forget the reason why we eat together if we um, over-intellectualise food. If we only see food as fuel, you take the joy and the humanity out of what food can be. If you only eat for pleasure, then you take away the nourishment and, you know, the the virtues that um, can be bestowed upon you in a health context from food. So I think that sometimes you can meet in the middle and you can have a healthy, delicious meal. But it's I think hard that, to get if you go out. Uh, it depends on where you, you go. Well, you know, I wouldn't know. It, so. depend, it depends on where you I mean, if you go to almost anywhere in the Byron Shire area. Yeah, different. It's a long way to drive. <laughs> you can, that they, you know, that particular region yeah. does, a, it's a great, one of the great food bowls of Australia. So you get incredible produce um, that's that's grown locally you have very talented chefs that are all attracted to living up there, producing incredible dishes with them, and you also have that lifestyle context. So they, they know their audience. Their audience. What's your favourite restaurant? There? Oh, there are the so hunt? many. There are so many. Um, uh, uh, the Doma in Federal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that. Um, 
That, is that the Japanese place? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like a Japanese, yep. a Japanese well, uh, the cafe. The hut is some other direction. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, God, what did he call it? Matt Stone's now involved in it. Like you, I think they called it You Beauty or something like that. It's in Bar, uh, in Bangalore. In Bangalore. As well. Yeah, um, yeah I know. The Eltham Hotel, yeah, the yeah. guys running yeah, the Eltham. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, it's a great pub. Tim Gogan, excellent chef. Um, there are so many at the farm, obviously. Yeah. That's a, it's a but if you peel back to Sydney. <laughs> um, uh, well, we're just down the road from, you know, from from Bondi. And that's, again, highly privileged areas are a magnet for what you're talking about, which is Correct. Con- consolidating within one meal all the virtues and not sacrificing the joy and the, the flavour and the taste. And that's... So there's there's that, and for the lucky few, that is possible, that's accessible. But more and more, when I speak to chefs, when I speak to people in food, sim- if you distill it down, there's no such thing as a f- as, a, as a superfood. There isn't. It's just foods have certain nutritional benefits. Some of them are synergistic when you consume them together. But the simplest food, grown deep, like the best quality food that you can find that you you have um, access to if you know how to cook you can produce that for yourself and I think that that's where we mustn't forget about the virtues of cooking um, the skills of being able to nourish ourselves if you know how to take a carrot as you you know mentioned with our friend Fazzy um, take a carrot and transform that into something that is delicious and you can do that yourself a carrot is not an expensive ingredient to purchase so you empower yourself by knowing what to do with it he also told me don't go and buy it at uh, the expensive uh, food outlets of the expensive grocers because they everything there was perfect he said you can go and buy it for ugly 50 percent of the at. yeah yes we told me so you can always, it's always much cheaper somewhere else i, I want to move from there just to your new show on sbs can yep. you just quickly tell me about what's going on there because it seems a bit off uh, off beat for you. Off, off brand. Yeah, I'm all about 2024 is the year of off brand. So what is it? T- t- what's the show called? <laughs> it's called The Hospital in the Deep End. But so what is it a, about? It's a three part documentary series on SBS, and it's about, um, I guess, a different look at the pressures on the public health system. So I was very fortunate to work with Samuel Johnson and Costa Georgiades as well on this project. And we each have a different... Costa Georgiades um, as in the beard. As in... I saw him the, the other day at Bonner Junction. Yeah, he's cool. He's a goddamn legend. He's sunshine in human. And 100%. Like I immediately <laughs> felt warm towards him like when I was talking. Like You he, just want to hug him. He's so nice. You just want to hug him. One of my favourite T-shirts that he has um, that's the N- NWA straight out of Compton, it's straight out of compost. <laughs> it's just there isn't a So you guys are doing it together? So we um, we didn't spend a huge amount of time together because I guess we were tasked with going off to different parts of the hospital that related in some way to our life story. So, um, you know, for Costa it was um, vulnerable community outreach work. It was um, he also attended a, a heart transplant because his father passed away from a, a, from a heart attack in St Vincent's Hospital, which was obviously a really challenging thing for him. Um, for Sam, it was um, going into Panda, you know, the um, drug dependency wards, talking about addiction, but also cancer research as well, which is a huge part of who he is and and a tremendous contribution that he has um, he's given to um, to Australians in terms of. Um, championing cancer research and raising money for it. He's excellent at that. For me, my mum being, um, she was a nurse unit manager in emer- in an emergency department, not at St Vincent's but a different hospital. And as we mentioned before, she pulled a lot of night shifts growing up. I didn't see my mum a lot. And so she was at this mystical place every single night. She would get in the car around sort of 9, 9 p.m. I'd hear the, the door click and, and off she'd go. And she spent the whole night while I was asleep in this place contributing to saving lives. And I was given this unique opportunity to spend some time to get a glimpse into what that must have been like for her. And why would I say no to that opportunity? So I got to do that. I I also got to spend some time uh, in surgery. So I I watched a, a... breast reconstruction post mastectomy so the patient had decided five years on from having a single mastectomy that she wanted a reconstruction and what they do is harvest um, tissue from the abdomen to reconstruct the breast and I was 
you know, like fortunate enough to bear witness to this transformative operation for her because this is going to give back some meaning to her life. You know, there was some part of her that she, um, you know, tangible part of womanhood that she had lost in the cancer. And so to be there watching two plastic surgeons harvest tissue, reconnect blood vessels under microscopes um, over a five, six hour period, I mean, incredible. And that's a, a service that's offered in the public health system. And so to understand the care that doctors, nurses and admin staff in hospitals take for strangers on their worst days um, and how much pressure is on the system to deliver these services um, and deliver them happily when there's so much pressure. Po in a post-COVID world, public hospitals, you know, everyone's gun shy. Everyone's afraid that someone's going to lose it at them because that's what has happened over the last couple of years so to be able to meet these people in their environment to understand why they do what they do why they continue to do what they so do so you would turn the spotlight on them and bring it to life they're the real heroes that's so cool to to bring voice to that that's was amazing and it's not dissimilar to what i've what i do on master chef or what i've done on master chef which is to be there to create a structure for other people's stories and to celebrate the stories of others that's a, a great privilege it's for me what I'm realising as I get older and the longer I do this job is it's about the fascination with human stories. That's really what lights my brain up. Well, I've got one more thing before we close off. Um, and, uh, oh, I think and, I know where you're yeah. going. So, I mean, how the hell does a petite um, – well, you're a petite young woman to me anyway. <laughs> um, a petite young woman um, and I'm just, I was looking at your knuckles and I was looking at your hands you, and your ears. I can't see your ears but your ears no don't look too erect yet. But uh, what's the MMA deal? Or, or the, is it <laughs> well, jujitsu or what? What is it like, about? Like I said, it's it's 2024, the year of doing off-brand things. Um, and I joke about that, but I, I kind of I get a little bit of a giggle out of people being surprised by the other things that I'm interested in that don't seemingly connect. And MMA happens to be one of them. I do. I think they all connect. It's all about human stories. I want to know what it takes for someone to sacrifice time with family, um, you know, go into fight camp for three months and then ultimately walk into an octagon, have the cage door shut and it's you and one other person stripped bare well, you've got it's something just, on. Well, you've got something on. Not literally strip bare. Yeah. It's just you. So, who are you doing it with? Where, where are you doing this? I don't do MMA. No, but I you, mean, I, are you I, going to comment on it, or are you writing about it? What, what's what's your role in it, or, <laughs> or is it something? It started off. I started off as just being an, an epic fan. I've done kickboxing, and I yep. grew up with a family who was heavily into martial arts. But that's not what's informed this interest. For me, I think it started in the pandemic, and I, I started watching UFC, and it's. Like I said, it's it's a fascinating sport. It's from a business perspective, it's the you know fastest growing sport in the world. It's only yep. young. It's only thirty years. Thirty years, multi billion dollar industry, flawless production. Everything about it is slick. It's amazing. It's well thought out, and it's dynamic. And I I love that part of it. So I recently uh, hosted UFC two nine seven. Fight week for Fox Sports and my very first sports broadcasting. Who, who were you on with? Who was on your panel? I was on with Dan the Hangman Hooker yeah. and Tyson Pedro. Okay, Tyson, yeah. And my very first two interviews were with Drickus Duplessis and also. You got himself Strickland. a bit of trouble the other day. The, well, they have both gotten themselves into a lot of trouble. Well, but he looked like he was on the receiving end of me, like uh, from what I saw. But Are you uh, talking about the crowd fight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, that was... Um, but I thought he, he conducted himself quite well in the interview after. He was sort of quite well, composed. Have you not seen the most recent footage? They're mates. They, they've been hugging it out in Toronto. So, you know, they've moved past the, you know, the, the theatre and the drama of it all and they just want to fight each but other But are now. you going to so go and do it? Am I going to Are you going to go MMA? and do, learn jiu-jitsu or do something? I feel like... You feel compelled? The network might not allow me to get punched but one, in the face. But, 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 but I don't know. I, I mean, that you heal pretty quickly, especially <laughs> if you eat the right food. <laughs> Was it bones heal, chicks dig scars? Is that the, <laughs> that's, the, that's the But same. But you do heal quickly I can because I did it this morning before I came here. I, yeah. mean, I, was, I do. I do, I, I do other things. Like I, I, do, um, I do interval training. I do Pilates. I, you know, I, I need to keep fit in this job. Do you ever feel compelled though to sort of start rolling around the joint and, uh, you know? Jiu-Jitsu is fascinating. Yeah. I think that Jiu-Jitsu, um, there's tremendous economy of strength and 
people of small stature like myself um, can still find um, effective ways of subduing someone in, in that capacity. I think that jiu-jitsu is an amazing sport. But, you know, MMA can be so many different oh, totally. different disciplines, which is brilliant, everything from boxing to Muay Thai and, and um, all the rest of it. And I think that's what I love about it is it's like chess with dire consequences. Yeah, a lot that's of strategy. Way, that's the way that I, I read it is you have a kit bag of different disciplines. Your opponent has a kit bag of different disciplines. And what's the strategy going into that? Like how do you win that? And I think the the unpredictability of the outcome is what makes UFC such an exciting sport. And I I'm a huge fan. Like I said, I, I'm not I'm, I'm not a fighter myself and I am still learning the technical elements of what it is but what I feel like I can speak on and what I feel like I can contribute to is teasing out those stories of I mean you've got to have a chip on your shoulder right to be a fighter why do you fight it's not just money you're trying to prove something I interviewed Sean Strickland and he'd gotten to the point where he did not want to talk about his childhood trauma anymore he did not want to talk about beef between him and, and Duplessis but he just sort of said, oh, you know, like they just hand you stacks of cash and that's, you know, that's why I'm doing this fight and that's utter bullshit. Mm. Money is not the ultimate motivator. If you're, if you're only motivated by money, you are going to be very disappointed in life because it's hollow and it's fleeting and if you don't have more to fight for than that, then life is not worth living. So I want to know what it is, like what it is about that person. You want to bring this story out. Yeah. Again, it's like you do a master chef. That's it's funny, uh, Bam Bam, the Thai two of us are <sighs> sat right there. And uh, he just said to me, like, uh, if I don't do, if I hadn't have done UFC, um, I would never have had the opportunity to build a brand, yeah. which is all about a brand. The whole right. shoey thing is a brand. Yeah. And I uh, wouldn't be able to get my own beer brand and all the other stuff that he's doing out there at um, in Penrith. And, uh, and get my family to have a better life. Um, it's just opportunity, that's, which you would never have otherwise had. That's exactly it. And for some people, it's um, they're working out their demons. And had they not had the the environment, the safe environment like you have seen to work out their demons, it might be would, done somewhere else. They would be living a very, very different life. And um, in many ways, you have seen might have saved them. So. There are so many different reasons and purposes for why people do what they do. And the more I go down this road of, of meeting people of all different sorts of backgrounds, I want to know what their reasons for living are. It's like much like what you do with this podcast. It's why are you here? That's what I'm trying to find out from you why today. Why are you here? And I think, <laughs> I think I found out a lot of really cool stuff. And I mean, I, you have, you're a little bit random in that, <laughs> in that you sort of <laughs> can you, I put I'm putting that on my seat. But you are a little bit random in terms of the things you do, but yeah. um, but equally there's a common denominator. Yeah, and the common de- denominator on all of these is uh, what's someone's story? How can you bring that to life? Yeah, and that's pretty cool. And that's actually a it's, real privilege. It is. It really, really is. Having someone trust you enough to share mm. is incredible, and that's what I get out of it. Is the honour that I feel that someone would feel like I'm safe enough to to bear what they have to say, to hold who they are, that's really cool. I mean, it's it's all about human connection. You know, there's lots of different complexities that have um, I've experienced in life that have led me to feel the lowest lows and the highest highs. And if that's me in my very random life, I mean, my career has been incredibly piecemeal. There's no strategy to it other than to feel my way through it and feel what is true to me and hold on to that and chase it. Um, if I can feel that, then I want to meet people that are open enough to want to share in return why they are the way that they are. It's interesting that um, you get a great deal of... Um satisfaction and joy out of someone trusting you enough yeah. to tell to feel like they're in a safe they're, they they are safe enough to tell you the story because that becomes an affirmation of your own morality um for me because i do it mm. that's what i do every day but mm. um it just means that uh, mark you act properly um mm. 
no one feels like you, you know you're going to pull their shorts down in public you know like uh, they are happy enough to tell you what they what's, what drives them yeah. what they feel good about and in a selfish way um it's important to me because it sort of um confirms some of my ethics about myself yeah and uh and i, I go back to that you know point i made very early in the discussion today Sometimes we do these things for selfish reasons, which aren't, aren't bad selfish reasons. They're mm. good selfish reasons because everybody gets something out of it. And it always comes back to our, our ethics, what, what we value in life. Yeah. You know? e- ego is really important. I think that ego can run rampant and, you know, when it's disproportionate to what else you fit into your life, that's where danger can happen. But the ego is still our, our, our guiding principle. It's what protects us, it's what keeps us safe and gives us a sense of individuality. Um, but it's, 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 all, it's all part of it. And to the selfish part of it is the inevitable comparison of questioning and comparing your morality and your code of ethics against other people. And I think the more self-aware you become, the more you're able to kind of do that in a, in a healthy context and the hope is always that you can learn something that will take you to the next level of, I don't know, understanding, appreciation of life, whatever it happens to Just be, contentment, peace. And awareness. Aware, but awareness. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a two-edged, you know. It's, it can um, be scary. It can be really scary. It can be dark. Um, and it can make you feel lonely depending on what room you're sitting in. Mm. Um, I've learned that the hard way you cannot expect people to meet you where you are and you can't resent them for not being where you are. You have to just accept people for who they are and, um, and make peace with that sometimes. Well, Mel Leong, that is, <laughs> that is a pretty good way to end this off. Thanks very much. Thank Appreciate you so it. Much.